Hello everybody, I'm going to talk about modern Linux environment and mobile devices today. And before I start, I have a few questions. Uh, first is, who has heard of Postmark OS before? Nice, that's about half the room. Who has installed it before on their device? <laughs> this is also quite a bunch of people. And who has used Postmark OS to uh, call the pizza delivery guy? Okay, that's no one. I expected this because Postmark OS is experimental actually. It's only meant to be used by developers and please don't expect the following things to work on your device right now. So phone calls, texting, Bluetooth, the mail icon, accelerated graphics and Plasma Mobile will likely not work on your own device. Also, there are no updates for closed source firmware blocks, which is a problem in general because after the two years of support from the vendor runs out, we won't get new versions of the programs running on the cellular modem and on the Wi-Fi modem. So the security issues there won't be fixed. And we have two ideas to fix this. The first one is just replacing the closed source blocks with free software, for example, Osmocom BB. And the other idea is um, yeah, just binary patching the blocks with programs like Maximum. So for the first idea with replacing the code with free software, we have a whole blog post if you want to read it. And I will put a link at the end of the talk. So why do we go through all this trouble? What's wrong with Android? I have a few points there. Um, first of all, Android open source project, AOSP, is, behind, is developed behind closed curtains, so they only publish the source code together with the binary release. That of course makes it hard to fork the code, because whenever you need to rebase, you can only rebase after they release the code, and then you always run behind. And of course the stock Android version you can use has proprietary components, that's not so nice. And I have a whole list of uh, points here. One important thing is you have a lot of tracking in the default setup. So I experienced this myself because I installed the stock Android lately and it took me about half an hour to go through all the settings and disable all the permissions. And there was something particularly nasty because I was in the permissions menu and I disabled everything like access to contacts and storage and microphone and everything. And then I went to the upper menu and noticed another point saying modify system settings. And some apps which were installed by default had this, to, had this enabled by default. And this meant everything I said in the earlier menu just was reset instantly. So I went back and checked it and it's, it's really not user-friendly, so I had to turn this setting off as well and then go back to the permissions and then turn off everything again. And only after that, it seemed like it was disabled. So they are really trying to, to get all this access and they are not really caring about the users, it seems. Same is for the, for the app shops. There are a lot of applications in there that are just trying to display your advertisements all the time. For example, there are games where you have to tap the screen and when you lose the game, they show a big advertisement right in the spot where you need to tap the screen, so you tap it again and it opens in your browser and the vendor of the game gains some money and you are just frustrated, but you keep on playing because it's addictive. So <laughs> I'm comparing this to desktop Linux distributions and you won't find any of that there. So that's my standard basically. Yeah, and as I said, I have a whole list here. A big point is you only have two years of support, and that's the maximum. Oftentimes you don't have as much support. And yeah, of course the security issues, for example, stage fright left one billion devices vulnerable, at least. And you won't see any patches for that. So, yeah, let's move on. There is F-Droid Replicant, Lineage OS, and Helium, of course. And I think these are excellent projects but they only fix the symptoms and not the root cause and they will always have this uphill battle whenever they rebase, it takes time and everything. Here's a screenshot from the Lineage, Lineage OS, I think you pronounce it, GitHub project and you can see they have almost 2,000 repositories 
and 96 people maintaining those, and this isn't really possible. So what happens is you have all these kernel repositories, for example, because each device has their own kernel repository from the vendor originally, and they are all outdated, they all have security issues. So that's not so nice. This is not sustainable, and as I said, desktop Linux distributions don't have these problems. So let's ban the Linux distribution to replace Android. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to install a lot of packages on the Linux distribution from where we want to install to the phone. And it turns out, of course, on Linux distributions, the packages have different names. So it's not, it's not really, you can't really make a step-by-step -step guide that works on every distribution. And also, the phones themselves, they require different flashing applications. And even if they have the same flashing application, like fastboot, for example, you will sometimes need special vendor bytes that need to be sent to the device. So all in all, it's a big mess and there is no standard way to do it all. So what happened was a bunch of shell scripts were written and eventually they turned into the Python program PM Bootstrap. Now what this program does is set up multiple change routes for building and flashing. And it even uses Ccache and this CC, some clever hacks to make it fast. And the flashing is abstracted with simple commands that work for all the devices. Also, you have almost zero dependencies, so you can just clone it from GitLab and get started. The only things you need is Python 3, OpenSSL, and CoreUtils, and this is almost installed in all Linux distributions. And it's also easy to reset these change routes, and of course, then you can easily reproduce any issues you might have. So, we better need a small distribution then, if you are going to use change routes. Who knows which distribution we are using? Yeah. Tell me. Alpine. Yeah, right, it's Alpine Linux. And the base installation size of Alpine is just 6 megabytes. So it's really small. Here's the stack. It uses ModelLibc, VisiBox, OpenRC, LDK, and Ableit. And the APK from, from Alpine is not the same as from Android, of course. It's a bit confusing, maybe. And they have stable and rolling releases also, which is very useful because on your phone you don't want to have rolling release all the time and then maybe your alarm clock doesn't work or something. You want to have stable stuff eventually. And it turns out Plasma was not packaged when this decision was made, but I'm here at Academy, so I promise you we will have some pictures of running Plasma on it later. All right, here are the blog posts we had. So these are basically the milestones to, to give you an idea how the project developed. And this is the first post. It was called Aiming for a 10-year life cycle for smartphones on the 26th of May, 2017. We had two booting devices, one contributor, that's yours truly, and the Linear as kernels were used at this point. PM Bootstrap was released, and we had Weston running on private drivers. So Weston is the reference compositor for Wayland, and we had it running without all the Android user space drivers, which almost all other projects at the time were using. Then 50 days later, we had eight booting devices and another eight work in progress devices, 13 contributors, the first non-Android device, and the first one with Wi-Fi working. It's the Samsung i9070. This was done by Daniele De Bernardi. I hope I pronounced it right. And we had a porting guide, so it allowed to quickly do new ports. Here's a photo of the First non Android device, it's the classic Nokia N900 from 2009. Cute, right? It's showing a console music player there. And this was done by Martin Brahm, and he's also the guy who did a lot of the artwork I'm using in this presentation. So, another 50 days later, we had 17 booting devices, 27 contributors, and the first time we had Plasma Mobile and Hilden running actually. So, you know Plasma. Obviously, and Hilton is 
the desktop which run on the device I just showed you, the M900. And at this point in time, we were running both in QMU. And also we had the Android Recovery Zip supported, which you can see on the left. And this was done by Attila Solosi. And yeah, here's a short video of how Plasma looked like at the point. So it's a bit buggy. And the work for this was done by Bart Rivers. And we had a lot of help from Busha and Shah also. And we even were able to use KDE patches from Michael Pine, who was, for some reason, developing patches to make a KDE Rhino model. And remember, I know there are a lot of glitches in there, but... Ah, oh, hi. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we used your patches. So, um, yeah, we had 80 packages to get KDE working. And this is a big number, and I double-checked it, but really KDE is kind of big, and we... Right now we have about 100 packages. Next slide, uh, here's the Nokia 900 again. This time running the mainline kernel already, or at least the kernel pretty close to it. It's 4.12, and the device originally came with a 2.6 or something kernel, so big step ahead. And this was done by, this was built, building on the work by Sebastian Reichel and Pavel Marshek and a lot of other kernel hackers. Now the next post was called 290 days of post market OS. Maybe you can see a pattern. We had 42 booting devices, 57 contributors, and we had a lot of UIs running on actual fonts this time, including Plasma Mobile, GNOME, Hilton, Lunar SUI, Mate, Western, and XFCE4. And this was a collaboration between many developers. As you can see from the date, we kind of did this in the winter holidays because post market OS is a free time project. So we had some time there, and also there's a Christmas tree in the background of the folks. All right, so here's how Plasma looked like, Plasma Mobile, on the Sony Xperia Z2 tablet. This was done by Craig Tedler, and it's running close to mainline as well. And the graphics stack is done with free Reno in the user space. So again, we don't need to use Android drivers. We can use a free software user space implementation there. This, the free Reno user space driver is mainly developed by Rob Clark and a lot of helping hands also. So I guess you like videos. Here's another one. Um, this is showing Kirigami UI, which is KDE's framework for responsive applications that look good on mobile as well on the desktop. And yeah, here's Craig playing with some demos, as you can see. Here's the final blog post. It was called One Year of Post Market OS Mainline Calling. And we had 84 booting devices, 106 contributors, and we have the Nexus 5 using cellular modem from CLI on mainline. Here's the Nexus 5 on the left, and it's, it's running Firefox. And we had a mainline guide, so even people who don't really know about kernel hacking can now look at our wiki and they can figure out how they can get started with mainlining their own device. And the idea of the guide is, of course, kernel hacking is not that easy, but we have some experts like Drake who is willing to help if you, if you ask them for help. Here's another photo running the 4.17 RC3 kernel on the Nexus 5. And this was done by a worker from Bushan Shah, then continued by Jonathan Marek, and also Craig Tedler helped a lot. And here you can see the cellular model, modem signal strength displayed in Plasma Mobile. So as you can see, the, we can talk to the cellular modem also without running any Android code in the user space, which was a great achievement. And here's even a phone call. So on the right is Android, and on the left is PostMarket OS, and you can see it runs the terminal and executes a Python script. And yeah, it's <laughs> really no problem. As I said, it's not really for daily users at this point. But it's making a call, so it's pretty nice. All right.
I mentioned this peer bootstrap tool. You might want to know how to use it. As I mentioned, the setup is pretty easy. You just run git clone from the GitLab URL, then you go into the folder, and then you run the init script, basically. And it will ask you some questions, like which device do you want to port, and which UI do you want to have, Plasma or something else, and, uh, and where do you want to store all the files and everything. And then it's set up, that's everything. So it's, it's just three steps, basically. Afterwards, you can install a pleasure to a phone. Typically, typically, this is done with these commands. You run install, then it builds the whole root file system. Then you flash the kernel, and finally the root file system on your device. And you can also run it in QMU nowadays. So you would install it again without full disk encryption. And yeah, I didn't mention it yet. It's can use full disk encryption and even have this by default. Uh, but here you can disable it and then you type PM bootstrap QMU and that's it. It executes a whole QMU instance with post market OS running. And you don't need to specify all the parameters as you usually need, like where is the image and everything. This all goes automatically. Now, you might also wonder how you would modify and build packages. The packages are in the same Git repository. So you just use your favorite editor and start editing these package builds. Here's the one for Kvin from KDE. And after you have modified it, possibly changed the sources, then you would run the checksum command. So it downloads the sources again and refreshes the checksums, basically. And then you can build it, also with one line. We also have some variations for building. So if you want to cross compile the package, you would just say minus minus arch is arm hf. And that's it. And then it files up the cross compiler. And you can even specify a different source folder. So if you have Kvin checked out locally and you want to do some bleeding edge patches, hacking on it, you would use this syntax and you can of course combine those. And then it builds one instance directly from your source tree. So how does the build recipe look like? It's pretty similar similar to Arch Linux actually. It looks like a lot of text, but most of it is just some variables describing the dependencies and a description and the actual build step is are just these few lines here, the CMake call basically. And here's the package call. And below are the checksums for some security. So it's not that complicated. It's really easy to contribute, I think. And you can even generate those with PM Bootstrap if you want to. All right. So yeah, and it fits on one slide, obviously. So it's really not much. So thanks to all the contributors who brought this to you. And thank you for listening, everyone. And please, if you have some questions, feel free to ask them. So the big picture is of course getting a daily driver working that you can use post market OS on your device every day. But as we are doing this in our free time, we don't have a strict schedule, so we work with whoever contributes and who has the time to do something. And from KDE, well, Bushan is already helping a lot. I think, yeah, maybe if more people tried it out, contributed more, maybe developed some apps with Kirigami. That's mostly it, I think.
in the 90s we had a Okay. Yeah. In the 90s we had a monopoly on the main train, totally different area. Okay. And this uh, monopoly was then with IBM and the European Union forced IBM to open up the platform, which leaded then to clones from Hitachi and other companies. And uh, now we have a similar situation with Android. Android uh, also is a monopoly in some areas and um, the, the EU now just put a fine on Google, a multi-billion fine because they are abusing this uh, monopoly. And um, I also see the aspect for the, the environment. It's rather bad that you are yes. actually forced to buy a phone in most cases before the two years, because uh, the two year typically is calculated from the day when they uh, issue a phone and release a new phone, but it's then produced for something like maybe 10 or 12 months. Yeah. And a lot of people can only afford the phones at the end of the life cycle. So they will only have the patches for like something like 12 months or so. And it poses an increasing risk also on society, people running uh, unpatched phones. And so I'm wondering if we should go for the political side and maybe via, again via the uh, European Union uh, to ask for these environmental reasons and for general security reasons and for business reasons, which means about abuses of uh, monopoly that if the companies decide to abandon the devices and don't support them anymore and don't provide especially security fixes, that they are forced to open up the specification and maybe in some cases also open up the, the binary firmware so that we can learn from them to write our new free software. Uh, would that be helpful? Of course, yeah. Uh, that's a good pointer. Maybe we can look into that, yes. This would be really great actually and I didn't know about the, EU, the European Union complaining, but they, it's right, it's a monopoly and yeah, I, I also think we, uh, we need to do something about this, uh, this huge waste from the two years of support and yeah, the best case would be if everything was open, all the firmware, then we could just patch it on our own. So, thank you. Okay. Um Awesome presentation, awesome, awesome uh, progress. Thank you. Uh, you um, if uh, also if you have uh, some people coming to you uh, wanting to do some Kirigami application for the phone, uh, please uh, send them our way. Uh, we can also uh, talk a bit about later um, uh, how and where to send them. But yeah, I would. Uh, I would uh, like to open that as uh, I'm the maintainer of Kirigami. Um, and the uh, second question, would you recommend it also for uh, somebody looking for an operating system of a not necessarily a phone uh, uh, embedded kind of system? Yes, that's another popular thing you can do with post-market OS. You can just use it as, uh, as your embedded device. So you can transform your old phone into a Raspberry Pi with a lot of sense of privacy, if that's what you meant, yeah. Yeah, or, 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 or also use it on, um, on uh, ARM boards for those different things, but to, to use postmark OS is something that you guys are looking into that, or not much? So you were saying, um, if if you would recommend it to put it on development boards, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you can do that, of course. We have not looked much into that yet, but why not? <laughs> it should work. Yeah, uh, the porting process is really easy. So even if you only have the vendor kernel, all the infra infrastructure is in place. You just follow the porting guide. In the init step I mentioned earlier, you say, I want a new device, type in the name, and then you can add the URL to the kernel source code and then you have a new device package and it, you can run it on your embedded device as well, yeah, sure. So does Security Gummy site have a homepage or where should we direct people? Okay, so we have, uh, uh, at the moment it's basically a, a homepage but it's just, uh, just a, a landing description homepage for Okay, 
so thanks to the Telegram channel. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Well, I have no questions to ask, but just to say a big, big thank you for your efforts to liberate us from the Android jail. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> We don't have a fancy UI or something, but basically you can go to the command line and say APK update, upgrade, and then you get the new packages. And we have a script which you would need to call manually that also updates the command, but it's not smoothly integrated for end users. Yeah, it's not really normal updates or anything. Say again, please. It's just a package manager then. Yes. But that's, I think that's a feature because if you have a whole system image, then you can't really modify your system as much. For example, we support a bunch of UIs and then we would need to provide a new system image for each device, for each UI, so better have a lot of packages and very small device specific parts. Okay. Thanks. We have time for one last question. So, other, uh, other, um, uh, other by binary blocks, which is where the inside Android is, not only by, not only the web page and base and the modern and the modern part, but also the, uh, the uh, but also for the uh, the binary bi binaries for the sensors. Uh, modern smartphones include quite a lot of sensors, like light sensor or or or, or barometer or step counters and so on. And as far as I, I as far as I for quite a lot of those sensor binaries are also 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 binary blocks. Do you uh, are, um, uh, the, the, the somebody from your uh, from from your project is do, doing uh, doing uh, also doing a work on, on utilizing those sensors on on Linux on uh, on the on the post market OS uh, OS environment itself. I'm not sure I understood everything. Uh -huh. So you were saying if we want to access all the sensors without yes. Android drivers yes. in the user space. Okay, so. Well, that's, that's uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, as long as the support is there in the kernel, basically, mm -hmm. and we have some maybe free software user space drivers, then why not? So I think that's sure. I don't see why anybody would not want to have this, yeah. Okay. Can I add something to this? Yeah. So for the Nexus 5 port, we are actually using the, all the open source drivers for the sensors uh, because we are basically using mainline kernel and it does already have support for all the sensors present in the and the page set is already like on the main grid so and it will be hopefully more support for anything. Is this for many devices like this that there are open source extensions for the binary code? Uh, yeah, but they are in like more of or up to the kernel, so you need to plot that or to the kernel to the first two versions. Thanks, that's all. Um, thank you all for the wonderful talk. <laughs>